Good morning. Um, well, it's a little after 11, and uh, and I want to be sensitive to the lunch hour. Um, of uh, Herbert Walker Bush, um, and I wanted to, uh, our president and and uh, that the funeral ceremony is going on now, um, and not to be, and so if you would, uh, and be respectful of that, I would like to just take a moment of silence to recognize uh, his service to our country, uh, both as citizen and as a public official. So if you would, give me a moment of silence for, for President Bush. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in the in the vein of um, continuing our public service um, and in the honor of those that have gone before us in doing that, uh, this sub this special study committee has been working diligently um, over the past five meetings, uh, inclusive of this one, to listen to and understand the um, tax assessment process. Um, the material elements of that assessment process as well as the appeal process for the taxpayers and what um, due process is afforded to them um, to appeal their assessment and to seek a reconsideration of the values that have been assigned by the local assessing board of assessors. Um, in, the, in that, we are grateful to the Department of Revenue, Lynn Riley uh, in particular, for her and her staff um, and their involvement in this process and help their help in, um, in educating the committee and hopefully the public, those who have watched the proceedings, who have attended the proceedings. And I want to thank also all the stakeholders who have presented, who have come to the meetings uh, diligently and who have provided and submitted information to the committee, suggestions, comments, and testimony, both in, in writing and oral uh, to the committee that has been very much appreciated. Mr. Groom um, with me has, has diligently assembled all the information for the committee's consideration. You have a packet in front of you and I'll just point out the packet. We have a first document in this package that's clipped <laughs> is the House Study Committee on Reforming Real Property Taxation. It's a summary of suggested recommendations. This document here is uh, Brian and my attempt um, to summarize the, the suggestions that have been made by those stakeholders that have contributed suggestions, um, inclusive of any that may have come from the committee in our discussions, but they're you'll see that they're identified as to those that contributed. Um, in narrowing, Okay, and so you have that summary here. Then, and, and rather than repeating everything that has been presented to us, we try to synthesize it into key points. You'll see those there in the, in the summary. I would like the committee's consideration of including that summary with our report back to the House. Um, the second document you have in the stack is just a summary of, the, of, of our charge under the House Resolution 1317 and those that have participated in the process thus far. Behind that, you'll have a copy of every uh, submittal that has been provi provided to the committee so that those are all part of the record um, for future consideration by the General Assembly. Um, and then finally, You have a, a document that is was separate from the package, and these are these eight uh, proposed recommendations are my attempt at summarizing some of the concerns that I've raised and that members of the committee have raised through the discussion. Um, they parallel in some ways some of the suggestions made by stakeholders, um, and they are they are intended not to be overly specific. Um, but to give general concepts 
because I think the legislative process is the proper venue for the details. With that said, what I would like to do today is I would like to go through um, each of the eight suggestions that I have presented to the committee on this single loose leaf page. And then I would, after we've gone through each one of those, and if there are any additional recommendations or suggestions that the committee would like to make, then I would like to add that to the list. I would, I would prefer that that be the bullet point, if you will, recommendations of the committee, that we have one document that is that summary of recommendations, and that we attach to the committee's recommendation also the package that you've received here as just a reflective of what has been submitted. Not that they are the committee's recommendations per se, but just that that is a, a record. Are there any objections to that process? Okay. And with that, what I'd like to do is just go through each one of these items that, that I've placed in this loose leaf paper for you. The first one um, is identified, number one, says that um, sh it recommends shift to three-year valuations with a lock on the value except where the property owner has sold the property, made substantial improvements, or there has been substantial damage to the property. And in that, reform the assessment notice and billing cycle accordingly as a s subsidiary recommendation. Comments or thoughts on that particular recommendation. This is a recommendation that is derived from testimony that's been provided to the committee. We, we could. I was trying to keep things broad for the purposes of allowing um, legislative review and, and defining at that point in time, but if you certainly would want, like to, I, I'm open to suggestions. Turn your mic on. The, the, the suggestion was uh, providing a, a definition for the term substantial in the recommendation number one. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your setting out a, a process <coughs> for us, which I think makes very good sense. I'm a little um, curious about some of the things that happen, particularly in the metro area where the change in the value is pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are hot neighborhoods all of a sudden. And to what extent, and I have not discussed this with, with the Fulton County Assessor's Office, and um, so I have some concerns about whether a substantial damage might be expanded to include significant change or some reflection of changes in a neighborhood that are pretty dramatic. I don't know exactly how to, how to word that, but think about it a little bit. Okay. And I'd love to check with the county to see what they think about that. Well, uh, this is our last meeting. Last meeting. So um, uh, we, we, we do need to um, – we will need to make a decision today or a no decision either way, but this okay. will be our final. I won't continue okay. the, the, the process beyond this. I think this. it's a good suggestion. I just wonder if it, it keeps up with change adequately. And I think the, 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 the logic that has been presented um, and, 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 and my logic for including this in it is that what we, what we aren't seeing is a very regular and thorough reassessment. And that, that leads to, I think, the very problem you're seeing in Fulton County where you have a massive swing. And the it's not as though the market suddenly boomed in 2015-16 um, to, to the tune of, some in ca some cases, 100% of the valuation of property and, 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 and below. However, so the three-year process would, would do two things. One it would preserve the concept of taxpayers having certainty in their tax assessment for an extended period. And if, if it is appealed, if someone appeals it, we, we learned in this process that you can, if you appeal your tax assessment, then you are afforded um, the, the ability to lock that assessed value in whatever is determined for a period of three years. 
and we also learned that that what that does is that that creates a disparity within the marketplace and with the when within the quote unquote no longer uniform assessment because now that assessment has been changed now it's not changed as to all properties it's changed as to the singular property so then those values that property value is disparate from the other properties who did not property owners who did not appeal and over time if that is, if that continues it can tre creates a a non uniform digest a distortion in the digest so the other aspect of doing three years ensures that there is a three-year cycle of, of, of assessment yeah. um, and exactly um, and also ensures that if someone challenges that assessment on that three-year cycle that if they are proven to be correct then that prop that value is locked in but it, but it is um, it's open to anyone and everyone gets the same locked value so there's no change and then in, in the overall uniformity um, and then at the next cycle everyone gets another shot at having their all the properties re reassessed um, so it allows for everyone to be locked at a value um, and and also still affords the ability for people to appeal that value if they think it's different I added the exception to that because there were circumstances and we talked about this in terms of natural disasters um, and we and also the the improvements that individuals may make to their properties within that three year period may substantially change the value of the property, increasing the v property or decreasing the property value. And for those isolated events um, that are triggered either by the property owner making a change um, or by a natural disaster, it seems to me that there was some discussion about having to accommodate for that. Um, and that's why we worded it the way we did. So I noticed in the Maryland law they have a way th then if there's a, a significant increase that you can step it up over three years. So rather than having to, you know, have your increase be more than you could afford to pay, you could maybe pay a third of it each year. Yes. I mean, I don't know. The implementation of that sounds pretty difficult, but it, it would provide the taxpayer with a little bit of relief if, if their neighborhood has suddenly gotten very popular well if, you, if, if the neighborhood has gotten very that's a very good point if the neighborhood has gotten very popular then if you were locked in let's say in 2018 mm -hmm. your neighborhood has gotten very popular and and home sales are occurring quickly in that neighborhood the existing property owner at the assessed value in 18 would not see that dramatic e increase of ta impacting them in 19 and in 20, but obviously would incur that in 21. And then there was discussion about spreading that the, the payment schedule, if you will, over the next three years. That was some discussion in some of the submittals and, and testimony we received that allows for a incremental payment, uh, breaking it down into over a three year period to pay that. I'm that I wasn't getting to those details, but. Yeah, is that in your recommendation or not? No, okay. it's not. Okay. okay. I thought that would be an actual nightmare for the two public hearings. I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I wanted one of that. No, I think and that's that's why I, I I thought it was a good point made, but at the same time, what are the pros and cons of that of that point? And I thought administratively it could be a, a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Although it's a predictable amount each year. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So Chairman, this let me turn on. Let me, let me turn on your mic, Mr. Powers. Uh, yeah, this would actually what you're saying here. This would. This would if they did, an appraisal, it would not be appraised again until three years under any circumstances, and then. You, you, you still have. Um, uh, county governing authorities and school board opportunity to adjust millage rates and then what's going to happen at that three-year cycle is values raise again and I don't think we're in any better shape than where we are now okay my opinion I, I mean I can see potentially this having the same effect of of what you're talking about now yeah and would they be over the three-year period the, the board of assessors would be uh, doing their regular appraisals so assessments whatever the details of the recommendation yeah, that, you know Maryland does what they'll do is they'll break it into 
break the county into three three mm -hmm. appraisal process so that you're getting a true appraisal at least every three yeah. years I think other counties as do to that, yeah. as to that that grouping um, so that that's that's the logic behind it um, what you would set a mill rate that you'd know what your taxes were for a three-year period there would be another reappraisal obviously at the end of the three-year cycle so you'd have that but you what you would have is the taxpayers not being in a position of making appeals or having to appeal except for once every three years. That would be a savings in terms of the the impact of the taxpayer. It's a one one time every three year adjustment that you would seek to appeal as opposed to doing every year. Because what we're doing now is 100% of the properties are up for appeal. 100% of the properties are supposedly reassessed. Um, they are reassessed, but but whether or not they've actually had a, a true assessment as to at the level of detail that we might anticipate um, is, is si seems to not be the case. So in that respect, um, it would provide that, that level of consistency and lower the, the number of taxpayers that are, that are reevaluating or, or appealing their, their assessed values. That would be the benefit of the, of the three-year cycle. So if if they're do if the county is doing a third of each, a third, a third, a third, the value would be set for one part of the, for a third of the county in one year, and the second third in the next year, and the third third in the third year. I mean, I'm trying. I may be a little too much into the details, I, I, but I, I didn't go into that level of detail with the the statement. So that that wasn't that wasn't where I was trying to. I didn't want to go into those level of weeds because because. A, we're a study committee and we have limited time to, to study. Um, so that was, I, I thought we should leave that to, to more fairity now. Right. And if you have comments and you think it should be broken that way, that's that's the way Maryland, I, I understand it, does it. So that, that was the, a suggestion to look at and, and there seems to be some interest in that from the yeah. committee members. I'd like to hear more from a tax yeah, I'm, yeah. Okay, well, we can go through all of them. <coughs> I, um, so the next one was number two was frequent uh, review and access by the state and require state certification digest with penalties to benefit the taxpayers. Um, Board of Education not to be penalized. What we talked about in that process was there was a, the, the six-year cycle, if you will, the three-year cycle whereby DOR would review uh, a digest and, and approve it um, and if there were discrepancies in the digest that were noted, that would not be, there would be no ramifications for that until the next three year cycle, thus six years having transpired before it determined whether, an, whether a correction was made. And th that seemed to me, and, I, and my sense from the committee members, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm trying to read body language and with <laughs> that, uh, everybody has a mic, so they're free to use it. But um, in the absence of <coughs> hearing discussion, I, I, I discern and I thought that we, there was consensus around the idea that those six-year windows were too long. A three-year hard and fast was better, um, would provide for more, uh, require more accuracy and diligence see at the local level. And that there, we had talked briefly about how that if you fall, if your digest falls outside of the the parameters set by statute um, as to the 40% to 38, 38, 36%, I think it was, then the QBE funding and the funding for boards of education would be adversely impacted by that. Boards of education have no authority whatsoever to weigh in or dictate the assessment process. They don't make any appointments with the assessor's board. They have no influence whatsoever, and yet the schools are pe penalized. That is, ex that seems extremely disadvantageous to those systems that are already at a maximum millage rate of 20 mils. And if they're at their constitutional maximum, they have no recourse. There is no financial solution for them to resolve them if the assessors, board of assessors, made significant errors, such as to undermine their their QBE funding. That and that, that was concerning to me. And so 
that the statement there was added the Board of Education should not be penalized for those for failure to have the certified digest. And you remember, it's a, it's a $5 per parcel penalty that's paid by the taxpayers through a check written by the <coughs> Board of Commissioners. I, that doesn't seem fair to me. Um, so I'm just, you know, we're, we're basically paying the state for something that the Board of Assessors did wrongly and, we're, and the people who are paying for it are the very people who, whose monies we're relying on and they're paying the salaries of the individuals that are supposed to be doing the assessments correctly. Uh, to me, that five dollars ought to go back to the taxpayers in some way, shape, or form, um, or some other mechanism of recoupment back to the taxpayers for that that error. Um, th obviously, the logic of that five dollars is to offset the administrative costs of the state. So that's whether that's um, the best way to penalize or not. Um, I just made the suggestion that whatever penalties that we do think should be there should be to the benefit of the taxpayers um, more directly. I'm going to let those sit. I'm going to read through these because <laughs> number three I had suggested here, greater disclosure and transparency for taxpayers as to assessment process, as to assessment process, should be assessment process. and. Um, basis for assessed value. So we talked about, and, and these are general statements, so we talked about um, there being effectively, um, you know, a magic, if you will, behind what the assessors do. We, we were able to go back and look through the CAMA system and see how, what the inputs are, see the actual forms for most of the systems used across the state, not all and see how that system is built. And it's clearly built based upon a construction, cost of construction bottom line, and then adjustments made based upon sales, based upon other market data, based upon uh, sub subjectivity in terms of the, the quality of the structure. Um, but being able to identify what neighborhoods you're being compared to, um, in that specified sense of a neighborhood as we discussed with DOR. Um, um, being able to see that information so you can make a proper comparison of apples to apples when you do decide to appeal your, your assessment or choose not to because you actually learn that, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm lumped in a group that I think is, is, con is correct and consistent. So having more transparency at, at the forefront of that system um, and more access to information earlier, I think was something that uh, members of the committee had brought up as being beneficial to the taxpayers. And, and hopefully beneficial to the appeal process in that we eliminate appeals because they're resolved early or the taxpayer has the information to make an educated decision on whether or not to appeal. Transparency means availability. <laughs> we can add that to it. <laughs> I think, uh, Ms. Powers, you brought that up um, as, as something that you thought would be helpful to the system. Um, so um, the next item four was require taxpayers to asset, assert their own assessed value early in the process to encourage resolution. A failure of an appealing taxpayer to participate in the administrative appeal process uh, of her, her, his or her assessment would preclude appeal to Superior Court. This goes back to the, the the idea of kind of personal ownership. If you really think you have a disparate assessment, I, I think you shouldn't be able to game the system by playing coy, holding back information, trying to get to an appeal for the purposes of either obtaining attorney's fees or getting locks. I think, you, I think there needs to be an open dialogue. If we were wanting transparency on the front end from government, as a taxpayer who's going to engage in that process, I also think that the uh, assessor's office is entitled to a full a, a dialogue as to why you think your property should be reassessed or revalued and what that information is that drives that. Mr. Powers and I were talking earlier that you know not every taxpayer knows and, and you may not have a, and the window for time for the appeal is short, 45 days. Um, um, and I don't mean to, to speak with Mr. Powers. Um, is, is that fair? Yeah. And other, other comments on that point? 
I just hate removing anything from uh, from a taxpayer in the appeal process. I just I think we ought to be focusing on helping that taxpayer through this process, not not taking away any such uh, action that they can take. And 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 that's part of the reason why we have item number three is to provide that additional information. But I think balancing that off with also having an honest and open dialogue and not individuals gaming the system is important. So th th that was a trade-off that I was making between those two concepts and, and trying to make sure that we had some personal ownership on the front end from the uh, appellant. The, um, what I was thinking about, though, is, is if, the, uh, if the taxpayer appeals um, that what we would I think there's some concern about if if he or she does not know what value to assess on the property then that begs two logical questions to me one why are you appealing you don't know number two is, is that you don't know because you you could find out more information or you have more information and you think it's wrong so you could assert a case for why it's wrong um, providing that information early in the process or at some point in the process before it goes to court allows for the, the, the assessors, the board of assessors to make a determination as to whether to settle and resolve the, the claim. I think it's important to consider that whatever is asserted through this process should not be binding on the parties because it, it, it is a effectively a negotiation, if you will, a, 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 a negotiation towards settlement, resolution, or compromise as to, the, as to what you're trying to achieve trying to award a fair assessment by finding more new and, and more property specific data as to that appeal if you think it's wrong. Um, I felt it would be helpful in, as an attorney in practicing law, you, you can never negotiate with someone who doesn't tell you what they, what they want. So if I don't know what the position is, I, I'm, th th there's, no, there's nowhere for us to go. Um, and, and my experience is that uh, oftentimes in the majority of property taxpayers know a number. Their number is either what they paid last year or a little less. Um, and so there's a sense that, that <laughs> right. Well, that's my and, and that's my point. So so I, I, I was sold for more. I, I think that I think that realistically, <coughs> there may be some that legitimately don't know how off the assessment may be, but um, we, we do allow for property owners to file um, what they believe to be their assessed value uh, in April so that they can file that with the tax commissioner and then that triggers a reassessment and reevaluation of the property to see if there is a, a reason. So there's, a, there's an opportunity for the public to participate that's not well known and that goes back to some of the transparencies. <coughs> um, but even but we don't want to bar them for failing to, to not have submitted something at that point. I think that they, when they get their assessment, they can say, look, I, s I think this is 10% you know, too high or 20% too high or 100% too high in some cases we've seen. But um, to have a number and to have that dialogue I think is important. And the other part of this is that we see, we, we have testimony and documented <coughs> evidence that you know, 50% thereabout of those who file an appeal don't even show up. And there are reasons, there are legitimate reasons for why you don't show up. And our system is geared so you, if you miss the first one, you get a shot at a second one. So it's, it's geared to accommodate, you know, an unfortunate circumstance that may arise. Um, but I think that it's important that if, if they just fail to participate altogether, that should preclude any moving forward. Um, and, um, and so that, that was kind of the thinking there. I think there has to be some ownership on the property taxpayer to engage in that process and to be committed to it um, if indeed they think their value is off. And it, in that sense, it does two things. One is it may uh, limit, r reduce the number of appeals because people will engage earlier and, and be more precise in what they're looking for. Um, also, those that fail to engage can't reap the benefit of getting to Superior Court and, um, and, and claiming um, 
adversely against the assessors and sending the cases into an, another layer of appeal, if you will, that really, frankly, should have been resolved at the administrative level. That would also prohibit them from going to the BOE? No, no. I think that we would, if they, if they actually filed an appeal and said, we think that there's a, that, that this is wrong, and we think, I personally think my property value is wrong in terms of the assessment, and, or I don't think it's taxable, or I don't think it's, you know, uh, it's uniform. Um, all the basis that currently exist in law uh, would, 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 would re remain. And then if you think the value's off, you have to specify what the value you think it should be. Um, go to the BOE, uh, or as I had written down here, maybe go shift to hearing, to hearing officers. Go to an administrative yeah, level yeah, appeal, right. whether it's a BOE, a hearing officer, or the the current appraisal process, which I thought was really interesting and, and seemed to be a very helpful, business-friendly approach. But if you use either one of those, that in that process you have to engage, attend, and participate with, you know, with a value that, that you're seeking. Um, to just sit back and, and attend and say do nothing or not attend and, and try to pursue on is, uh, I don't think would be proper. So that was, that was the logic behind that. Number four. Number five was ensure fairness between taxpayer and government in terms of service delivery needs in the wake of a natural disaster. The Judge O'Neill had raised this concern, um, I think, and others had mentioned this as well. And I thought it was worth uh, pointing out, given what we've gone through in Southwest Georgia, that we we what to what extent do you do you should the law recognize that a natural disaster wipes away most, if not all, and actually can it can practically create a deficit to the property taxpayer. I mean, if you take a look at foresters that have trees that are down or a pecan orchard that's down, um, what you have in those situations is that the cost to try to go in and remove the timber, clear it, actually works as, as a negative in terms of the value. The, the property is arguably worthless and actually cost something to go in and, and, and clean up. Now, I don't think it goes to zero, but, but I think that the, there are practical consequences of a natural disaster that render the property at a much low, lower value than it would have been otherwise. And I think that it's important to recognize that that could occur. But at the same time, the kids are still going to school. I mean, you, you, we, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be crass, but the we've lost timber and we've lost value to the digest but the population is still there and still needs governmental services at the local level they still <coughs> have to attend classrooms teachers have to be paid um, sheriffs and deputies have to be paid jails have to be um, secure there's a, there, it, it, so that's why the concept is there to, to reiterate that that is something maybe we should look at and then see what balance we strike if any, if any at all. Any comments on that? Ms. Pat, could you pull the mic over to the... <laughs> what number is that, Judge? Is it witness one? Wit one, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> After Hadn't been gone that long. I've gotten awful senile in just a very <laughs> few. I used to know what these things were for. <laughs> uh, I, I thought about that, and there, there's, a, there's, and, and it's really tangible. I, I thought initially it was intangible, but it's really tangible for most people with uh, residential properties, which is in, in most in most counties the the bulk of of the the, the digest. Yeah. As far as uh, requiring all those services that you mentioned there is that there's in most cases an insurance accrued benefit so the, the property owner may be a formula that said well now my house because of casualty loss has been reduced from a hundred thousand to twenty thousand uh, there's another ten thousand dollar cost in cleanup which you mentioned is, is, is another actual that you're looking at to, for reparation but I'm also insured for eighty thousand so maybe, maybe a valuation methodology that takes into account 
going forward, the fact that, but, but what about uninsured homeowners if mm-hmm. their mortgages are paid off? I don't know how, the, how you do that equitably. But the reality is that, that the insured property owners, where they have improved properties, not the agricultural, and, and I guess agriculture in a way is an improvement. If they have crop insurance, a lot of them have those sort of things. Um, maybe that's a mitigation of the valuation that helps on the balancing of the public need side as opposed to the private devastation. That's all I was thinking about. I don't think we looked at those third party reimbursement possibilities that are out there. And the counties may actually can begin to look now that we've sort of had the realization of what a storm like that. And I happened to have driven through that the weekend before last. And it, it's unbelievable. I mean, the, the streets are packed bo- above the roof here with nothing but debris. And right. it still kind of falls out into the roads and makes them impassable. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- a-, a month later, there's been no real it doesn't even look like it's been cleaned up just yet. It's there's total devastation there, and it's sad, to, very sad to see. But, but uh, that the mitigation of the instant part of that that the county. What I'm getting to is that the counties may actually could look at the possibility of insurance products or sinking funds, you know, in their in their budgets too. And this may be some suggestion in the statute to, to say that m- at least. It should be something that they ought to consider, uh, some sort of stability insurance uh, that's sort of a, a a real overwritten insurance. You know, what do we call it, secondary mark? I mean, we're mm-hmm. Lloyd's of London kind of stuff. I don't know that such a product exists, but uh, I don't know that other states have ever thought about that either to casualty loss. But yeah. I think it's an excellent point. I mean, that that, that is um – and and just and just writing that number five the way I wrote it was to keep it general so that those kind of points could be made and, and ferreted out at a, at a more at a more uh, micro level. But I think what we ought to do is is if depending on what the general assembly wants to do, is it would probably be wise to look at Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, Kansas, um, and see how they deal with this because. The, the frequency of tornadoes that impact communities there and, you know, um, and wipe the communities literally off the face of the earth and leave them in the, in the rubble that we're seeing from, um, from the hurricane in southwest Georgia. Um, I, I think that th- there may be some guidance, there's maybe some policy, some legislative language that already exists in those states that may be helpful to address that particular issue. And then the concept of a sinking fund or just language in this in the code that suggests that this may be something that counties should think about in, in terms of having that that extra coverage whether a reserve fund uh, or or otherwise uh, through an insurance policy or not maybe um, maybe worth a recommendation if you will in statute that's a good point and I'm glad you and I'm Sincerely grateful that you raised them before, Judge, because I think that it was timely and it's, you know, and better to address it now as a lesson learned as opposed to just ignoring it and forgetting it and moving on. Um, the other item I had for number six was uh, reconsider the 85% payment on appeal rule and attorney's fees. These were suggestions that we had seen in some of the documents and testimony provided to us, the 85% rule allowing that the taxpayer only pay 85% on appeal. I'm not sure what real value that is. It seems to create a more of an administrative headache um, in terms of reimbursement. Mr. Powers, you may be able to help on that because it was just a point I thought was interesting and wanted to raise back with the committee. Well, it doesn't track. Um, we do see that there are just a bunch of numbers, I guess, to actually show, but that I believe there are situations where there's numerous refunds when it ends up through all the appeal. And and uh, by the taxpayer paying that 85%, it's not only better on their part, but it certainly is a, a, on a tax commissioner from a refund standpoint and additional paperwork, that type of thing. And does it build into the into the negotiations, if you will, a little bit more flexibility from the maybe from the government's perspective that, that 
that we know we have 85, uh, we just, is 15% we're really messing around with? Um, well, in, in I, I think the 85 of paying something was put in there to keep the taxpayer from not paying anything until the, you know, appeal was, uh, you know, came to conclusion. Uh, some of those things do drag on, especially if they go to, you know, through the superior court level. So that was the thought process of the 85%. And I believe um, House Bill 202 just a few years ago gave even the taxpayer the option of paying the 100%, if I remember it correctly. So I think that is actually in statute already. Mr. Chairman, I, I see in the tax court all the time an example of why there needs to be skin in the game up front by the taxpayer. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they have to be very, very cognizant of it at all times. When you file an action in tax court now in the state tax court, it stays all collection activity until that action is completed. Mm -hmm. And I get very, very suspicious of taxpayers that file their actions, the same ones like you that game the system, just to oh, stop I don't the collection. System. No, no. <laughs> that you, the same ones like you mentioned that would that would game the system. <laughs> and the whole purpose of filing the appeal is not a change in value. They never said what they really wanted. They rarely ever do a very good petition. But we can't execute against them. Yes. The state, you know, when I said we, the state of Georgia cannot execute against them. And then they continue their case. They continue their thing. We're on two month calendar call intervals. And all of a sudden I see three continuances. Then and it's all, they all come up with contrived. It, it's just unbelievable how well they play the, the, the game. And, and it gets very irritating to me when it finally dawns on me what's going on in the, in, in the court. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have this 85% of it, you'll just get everybody will file an appeal just to stay collection activities if it's just a financial situation that they're in. That's just human nature, and but it happens. To, yeah. But to be heard in superior court, you do have to at least pay that 85%. That 85% has to be paid. Should it be 100? Probably not, no, sir. <coughs> you know, we, and, I, and I'm, I know we're having this dialogue here in the, the fifth meeting of our, of our, but I thought there was so much education that we needed to make sure that we went through um, and make sure we took in all the information that you've had for a while to review we're really having this discussion today and so um, I, I appreciate you bearing with me I, I'm raising these points to try to ferret out some 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 comments from the committee so I I, won't, I want you to know I sincerely appreciate it we just haven't had that dialogue and those that are watching and those that have been here you know we haven't had this kind of back and forth dialogue um, examining the information we have so this is very helpful and I uh, and, and that's part of the reason why you have these points in front of you um, so I've got a no on 100%, and, and I see some heads nodding in agreement, it looks like. Just, and we'll come back to it. I just want to make sure we talked about it. Then the attorney's fees issue is, is uh, rolled that into that statement there. There's been discussion about, um, about a, a cap on the attorney's fees. Uh, I saw a number of 2.5% or uh, 2.5 times maybe. The amount um, uh, that was awarded as a value is, is is inconsistent with the the, um, the valuation versus what was actually awarded or determined later. You know, our system now is that you you don't get attorneys' fees if you fall within that 85 range. Um, you know, if there's a change anywhere in that 15 percent latitude, if you will, between the the, the amount paid at 85 percent versus 100 percent. But if you're if the assessor's office is outside of that, then attorneys' fees can be awarded. That system seems to work pretty well, um, but but that was a th that was a comment raised by several of the people that testified. Any thoughts on that? I'm inherently biased, so I mean, I'm just you know I'm not helping out here. I'm just I'm, I'm pitching it to all my non-lawyer colleagues on the. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next item, number seven, a reform of the public property tax notice, uh, ACCG had raised an issue about, uh, this is out, a little bit outside of, the, well, it's outside of the scope, period, of, of what we were doing, but I just wanted to point it out that there was a comment made by ACCG as to uh, reforming what is the 
the advertisement notices for uh, property taxes and that there seems to be some concern about the you know, how effective it is, how, um, how communicative it is to the taxpayers, how informative it is. So I, I, I raised it in here because it does go directly to what I will call a, um, a backdoor taxation that sometimes is felt to occur by taxpayers where the assessor's office is increasing the valuation of property at a pretty good clip and it, and those that believe in conspiracies believe that it's that it's done so that the tax the, the board of commissioners or the city council doesn't have to raise taxes so they never raise your taxes but yet they're getting more revenue by the backdoor tax increase which is your assessed values so i raise it only because there's that uh, that issue exists in terms of a, a concept or perception and you know, does the property tax notice in that does it, is that an opportunity to adjust that and, and provide better or um, information to the taxpayers or or not? That's why that's why it's included in this bullet point of the list. And maybe that's something that you know we want to hear more from from ACCG at, um, or the city's GMA at, at, a, at a later time. But that's why it's in there. And then number eight, the last one I listed here was consider replacing the BOE, the Board of Equalization, with state trained and employed hearing officers. Um, this concept was raised as a result of um, anecdotal information that the Board of Equalizations uh, are maybe, they, they are certified, they do get hours of training, but this feeling, the anecdotal feeling was that there's a default to just listen to what the assessor says and rely on that information and and to forward on a case or not resolve the case um, and not to challenge the assessor's office in terms of the value because the Board of Equalization is not in a stereotypical position to, to second guess. Um, and so the, the effectiveness of the Board of Equalization in my mind is in, is in question practically both by my own personal experience and um, and then from others that I've spoken to and from testimony we received here in this committee. So the, if you don't have a board of equalization, what do you have? And so you do need, you need some, you need individuals who are competent to challenge the assessment. And, and this goes back to uh, a point you were making earlier, Mr. Powers, about we want to, we want the property tax payer to to be able to engage in the system, but we we can't ask every property tax payer to hire a lawyer or to hire an appraiser or to hire some a consultant or an expert to try to resolve what may ultimately be a few thousand dollars in, in property tax difference from year to year. You 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 literally can wind up spending thousands of dollars challenging the assessor's office only to receive your, your, your return on investment, a modest reduction in your assessed value and thus a modest um, relief in terms of your property taxes. That's a heavy burden. Um, and if there is a hearing officer that is trained and that is there to challenge, if you will, um, the the assessment, the assessment process, the information, in effect, to to be that that person that um, that needs to be convinced, if you will, that the assessed value is correct, and that person is sophisticated and um, and is independent of the local uh, process, then would that not provide for a more meaningful appeal process and resolution process? on behalf of the taxpayer. And that's the question that I've had in my mind. Um, and, and, and obviously I've concluded it because I, I think that it would. How do you get there? I don't know. But I wanted to raise this point with the committee. I know it's not in the details, but who do they actually report to? I, I didn't I didn't want to get into that level of yeah. weeds. Um, <laughs> you know, we, uh, the two we've yeah. talked about are, you know, obviously the Department of Revenue. Uh, the other would be the Department of Audits. Those are the two that readily come to to mind, um, and so 
but that doesn't. But I don't want to get into that yeah. level. Uh, you know, I would prefer that we don't. If you do and you want to make a recommendation, then then I'm all fine for those motions. But my intention was to keep this at a thirty thousand foot level. But if you have a suggestion and you think it should be in the Department of Audits, then I'm, I'm happy to entertain that and put that in the recommendations. If you want it to be in the Department of Revenue, also happy to be our <laughs> commissioners here to, to to make statements accordingly. Or if there's somewhere else that you think it ought to be housed. But having the state, since the state does not collect a property tax, and thanks to um, my former majority leader, uh, Larry O'Neill, uh, our judge now, who spearheaded a concerted effort to roll back the state property tax, um, you know, I think that um, we, we don't. The state itself doesn't have an interest in um, a direct interest in seeing property tax assessments inflated for the benefit of of adding money to the state coffers. Um, so, places the state in a position of being uh, unbiased and and neutral in a sense. So that's why um, that's why I was suggesting. Uh, state trained and employed hearing officers. And then on the, th and I'll just add, on the three-year cycling, um, it, it would afford a smaller unit of hearing officers to be deployed as opposed to having to do this on an annual basis. So this tied back into the logic of a three-year, if, if we're doing, if, if we do a three-year appraisal system, then only a third of the state is being appraised, only a third of the state's property owners are appealing, and therefore we would only need a third of the amount of individuals to serve as hearing officers around the state or regionally um, in that context. So there's a practical side of that three-year um, proposal in step one, or in number one. I'm sorry, Judge, you were gonna say something, I cut you off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the leadership on this initiative. And I'm grateful that the Department of Revenue has had the opportunity to uh, participate and provide guidance on the administration of this property tax policy in the state. And with that in mind, I wanted to go on the record that I will abstain from voting on any of these policy recommendations as the representative of the agency that administers them. And again, appreciate that opportunity to be here to provide that information to the committee. Thank you. And thank you for all the information that uh, Ellen and, and your team have provided to us. Thank and we're really, really grateful for that. So when you were looking at uh, number six, I was just wondering what would prevent the government from assessing an amount in year two different from year one so that the amount in year two at 85% captures more by a significant amount than what was in year one? Well, the, the uniformity of assessment is required, so every property has to be uniformly assessed and then also the tax uniformly levied. But there, there would be, if the market and the, ep if the evidence shows that there is an increase in value of 15% in the subsequent year, that could be done. Um, and it also is there's a there really is a lock. So if the appeal is filed and and you're successful in your appeal and you have a, a value that is that is that is determined as a result of that appeal, that becomes the locked value for three years, the year of, and the two subsequent years. So the law already ad addresses that effectively a prohibition on uh, local boards of assessment um, seeking retribution, if you will, or, or seeking to, to recapitalize right. what it lost the year before. Um, so the 85% works in tandem with one. Assuming one is adopted, then that's the way number six works with it. But like if, if there wasn't the three-year lock-in rate, then number six, what I was just asking is if, if the state's guaranteed 85%, then as an assessor, if you're short, why not just make it such that the next year I assess a debt an amount more where 85% captured what they already paid and some. Yeah, and I don't think that assessors do that. Um, I, I think those, if those, if they occur, they're extremely rare um, occurrences. Um, but the, the design of that tax, of that lock is there to, to prevent it. Um, and also, frankly, it provides an incentive for you to appeal. Uh, it provides an incentive, financial incentive to lock in your values. 
and to do that on a three-year cycle. Every three years, go back in and appeal your value, try to lock it in. There, there are pros and cons to that lock. Um, and so one of the cons that I, that I see is that it creates that lack of uniformity within the system. And as it continues, if, if it perpetuates, then you have an ongoing disparate um, assessment value for property owners who are sophisticated and, and use the system to their advantage and those that the rest of us that go on and pay our taxes and move forward. Um, so the, the three year, the point number three and uh, number one that does a three year valuation accommodates that, um, that certainty that's given and, and would avoid um, assessments from being done in a punitive manner. Um, so that they, they do tie a hand in hand. I just wanted to go over that point with the 35 percent. Other questions? Well, let me um, let me do this. Um, we're, we're at noon. Let me get some advice from the committee. Um, we can continue on. I can send, uh, I can ask Ms. Pamela or Gordon or someone else to go get us some lunch. We can, uh, we can do both of those things. We can um, take these items up individually, collectively, however you would like. Um, we can also allow, if we want, those that have come today to, to give them a, a, a few minutes, if you will. I, I would like to give them 10, 15 minutes to comment on some of the points we've raised here today just to see some feedback and hear some feedback. Um, but I don't want to take a lot of time because we already have all their testimony. I don't want repeated testimony. I don't think that would be helpful. Um, so if you if you wanted to open it up to allow members of the public to speak, then I, as long as it's not a regurgitation of, the, of old testimony that's already been written or presented orally, then I if it's new testimony, I'd, like, I'd be interested in hearing it. If, if it's not, then I, I think we have all the information we need to, to make a recommendation, or uh, which may even be that we don't have one. But um, so I'm open to those kind of options. I just want to be sensitive to your time and recognize that we are at the lunch hour. Comments, suggestions on persevering, but I, I would like us to take some action today, but I, I don't want to be here all day, honestly. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone any, anyone here does, but um, I'd like to keep going. I'd like to keep going and, and, and seek resolution. And uh, part of the finality of it may be one last now that the recommendation suggestions are before the committee and the public uh, that we give the public a reasonable amount of time, ten or fifteen minutes to talk about specifically those recommendations. Again, not a regurgitation of all the information they so graciously have provided us, but uh, about the recommendations and tell us what they think about them before we make them. There may be unintended consequences we're not aware of that they can help us with. They certainly have, I understand they're advocating for a cause in most cases uh, from a perspective and, and that, I respect that. They, they ought to be. And we should have the benefit of that thought and then maybe have a vote as to whether or not we make these recommendations as a committee or not. I, mean, I can do that without lunch. But I'll send it here. If anybody is that, that okay with that, I don't mind you eating while we talk. Right, we're, we're definitely going to conclude this by one, so uh, it's not going to go on beyond that. Um, and um, <coughs> if that means I have to adjourn it, just to do it, we'll do it. Uh, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to abuse people's time. But I think that's I think that's a very wise suggestion. Is that okay with everyone? And Ms. Powers, you had a comment. Yeah, I just would, if you would, I understand that the 85 percent part on the payment on number four. Um, but I, I guess I'm a little confused about the attorney fee. Um, you said there's an instance when attorney fees are not allowed in, a, in an appeal. Well, if if um, I'm sorry. Make sure that mic's on. Is it seven? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, no, I, I think 
Yeah, if, if there's a window, um, depending on the valuation, it's ultimately determined whether attorney fees are awarded. So um, if, if my recollection is, is that if it is within, and um, uh, Mr. Ramsey's here, if he may re recall, other, there are other folks that are here, he may recall if I, if I misstate this, but my recollection is, is that you've paid 85% if, if the valuation is 85% or, or greater, just because you got a discounted valuation. Um, and, you, and, and it was determined that you were overassessed, and, and <coughs> so it was reduced by, let's say, 5%. No attorney's fees are awarded. But if it's south of 85%, it depends if it's commercial property or residential property. That's, that's another nuance in the law. If it's less than 85%, um, I think for commercial, and then if it's less than 80%, uh, sorry, 20% differential, then, uh, or let me restate that. If the assessed value is determined to be 20% or more off, then, then attorney's fees can be awarded in a residential setting. Uh, and then for 85 or 15% differential if it's commercial. So in other words, the assessor would have had to make an error of that significance in order before attorney's fees can be awarded. And I, it, is any, anybody here Want to speak on that just so we make sure we have clarity on that, Larry? Do you do you remember? If I'm misstating that, Joel. You may, I don't know if you remember. Is that witness too? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Larry Ramsey with ACCG. And to follow up, I th I think the situation we're talking about, and this would just be more anecdotal. I don't know how widespread it is, but take the example, so the 85%, you've got a residential property, and uh, I tell folks uh, I have an English degree, so bear with me on math, but uh, if the Board of Assessors, so let's say, values a property at $100,000, you go through court, and ultimately it's 85000 is the number set. And in that situation, that would trigger the payment of attorney's fees to the taxpayer. What I, w I was with Fulton County for many years, and so what you would sometimes see on a lower value property like that. Using that example, that $15,000 difference in assessed value, uh, as you know, uh, the actual tax basis is 40% of that, so that's $6,000. And if you take, say, a millage rate, let's, call, let's say it's 30 mills jurisdiction-wide, schools and county, for example. If my math is right, by going through that process, the taxpayers saved $180 in taxes. But the attorney's fees to get to that point might be $10,000 plus. Now that's, that's a philosophical issue, I think, for the Committee for the General Assembly um, about whether that's the ap appropriate use of taxpayer dollars in that situation. But I think that's the, an example, Mr. Chairman, of you know, is there a, would it be appropriate? And I think we are talking about taxpayer dollars at the end of the day paying this. Um, should the county be paying $10,000 in attorney's fees to in a situation where the taxpayer has saved $180. And that's just, you know, that example. But that's that's the issue, I think, or that does come up occasionally where the amount of attorney's fees that are awarded are disproportionate to what the taxpayer has saved through the process. And I think it's 80, then it's 80 percent if it's commercial, is that right? I believe that's so right, I, Mr. I Chairman. I flipped them around. So if the, if the commercial assessment is turned out to be, if it was using the same numbers, Eighty thousand, um, then you, then you would have a grounds for attorney's fees. They're, they're statutorily awarded uh, as a matter of as a matter of law. And, and there's some there's some case law out there where you you get this you get frankly attorney's fees that are um, that are in well in excess of what the the actual tax dollar received was being was was litigated about. Oh yes, yeah. I, I, I raise it because because it's been raised in our in our community in our in the submittals to us, and I wanted us to discuss it. Um, and so, no, the system is geared. Uh, so I think to to Larry's uh, Mr. Ramsey's point is that they are, you know, in in what he's saying is that is that a, an appropriate use of taxpayer money to pay an attorney? The the other side of it is is that it creates a check and balance, if you will, on the assessment process and incentivizes the assessors to get it right so that they're not spending taxpayer money on attorneys. Th th those are the two sides of it. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate, appreciate it. Um, is that, does that answer your question, Mr. Collins? It does. It does. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, um, so we, we've, we've talked about the point. I want to make sure we covered it. Now, let's, let's open it up, if we will, and let's, let me allow for 15 minutes for individuals to come and speak. You've, you've heard the eight points that I've raised. Before that, let me just let me ask the committee. Are there anything is it I've raised these points with you to have this discussion today. Are there any other things that you think we should uh, should discuss as a recommendation that members of the audience and the public should hear before we open it up for them to comment on them? Because I don't know if I've covered everything as that, that the committee as a whole would like to cover. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have one thought, and I apologize, and I think I missed two meetings, so maybe we covered this at a meeting and I didn't hear it. But with the first recommendation of shifting to a three-year valuation schedule, I'm thinking how that would work specifically in certain counties, the one we're sitting in, Fulton County, because right now I think more than 40 percent of the properties in Fulton County are under appeal currently. So if this is a great idea, and I think there's a lot of thought that it is, how are we going to transition to this? How are we going to phase this in? And another specific question I have is, if, you are going, if the tax assessor is going to assess one-third of the properties each year, do we want to think about how in practice do we want to put some constraints on that? Is the tax assessor free to come into a county as large and as long as Fulton County and say, we're going to do the north part of the county in year one, the middle county in year two, the South in year three, or might not it be more advised to say we're going to just throughout the county dispersing the properties we reappraise, but have it not be geographically um, determined. My concern is that it, if you did it, if the assessor came in and said we're going to do the South, the North, and the Center, it would just result in the, ba the balkanization of a county like Fulton. And I think the unanticipated result might be that every three years when people realize their assessment is about to go up, you would start seeing a lot of sales in, in that area, getting prepared for that. So that what is a good idea might ultimately drive property sales within and throughout a county in a way um, that makes sense in hindsight, but you need to think about it in advance. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good point. And, and and I, when, I, when we were talking about this kind of concept of three-year assessments, uh, originally my, my, my thinking was, was dividing the state itself up into three regions um, and then doing those regional assessments within the state so that these sets of counties would be doing their assessment, um, not, not necessarily within the, the county itself. Um, and the, but the suggestions come into us as opposed to my suggestion, but what's come into us from, from those that have testified and presented suggests that you do it within the county and, and to break the county into three. And, I, and that is a, to me, that is a very valid concern because it does create, you know, a question of, you know, what, it, what inherent biases may arise as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think the intent here is, and I don't think it would be legal to do it just on a geographic analysis. It would have to be based upon those similarly situated properties. So you, you, you're going back to a system that is inherent that we're using now, which is that the neighborhood system that um, we had talked about with, with DOR, that um, you know, a, a, a generalization, a neighborhood, if you will, of similarly situated homes in terms of construction, age, condition, um, and also relative sales kind of forms a, a neighborhood, and that's the, the technical term that they're using in-house, in if you will, um, not necessarily a subdivision neighborhood. And then within that concept, within that grouping, um, looking at whether or not there's been a change in that neighborhood of that mass appraisal of that group of, that group of structures. Um, and, that, and in doing it that way, what you're doing is you're creating a more uniform assessment and then and then associated tax levy. Um, if you just do it geographically um, within the county, then I don't think you're getting the uniformity 
I think uh, there may be a risk there in, right. in terms of practicing getting uniformity. So I think that's a really good point um, and, and one that would require a little, little more research. But my, the concept that when I was thinking about three years personally, I was thinking about dividing the state in itself into three geographic um, areas mm -hmm. so that the the county was on a this is your year to reassess and apply the assessment um, and then those numbers for that entire county would be locked in that way you're keeping the county unit as a as, as it is the assessment occurs across the board um, for within that the county the appeals are done then the, the appeal hearing team or DORs review or the Department of Audits review their digest would rotate every three years. So I, I'm not sure that there may be other implications in doing it that way as well that I haven't thought of, but that was <laughs> the theory. going to say it sounds like you have a county issue that you're trying to make a statewide issue out of. I, things are working well in Chatham County and I I would hate to go back to tell them that you're going to reappraise property once every three years. They do a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. Our Board of Equalization does a good job. I, I'm kind of lost here I guess. Okay. Other comments or suggestions? additions to the recommendation list that we have here um, that we want to add to before we let members of the public comment on it. I have one more um, mm -hmm. comment, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, on number seven, reforming the, prop the public property tax notice. I thought this was real interesting and it came from one of the recommendations of ACCG talking about, I think we're talking about the tax notice you have to put in the paper of notice of intent to increase taxes and I think Every taxing entity really struggles with having to publish that every year. And like the example of what we just did with the city of Atlanta, letting them out, just the city of Atlanta out from under having to advertise that tax increase. I think that tax increase, from what I understand, does two different things. It says, if we are not going to roll our budget back to be <coughs> revenue neutral, then we have to advertise a tax increase. <coughs> Am I right about that? So that, as I understand it, if a taxing entity is going to increase its budget from year one to year two, they're going to have to tell the public. That's part of what that taxpayer's <coughs> bill of rights does. But the other thing is says, tells the taxing entity, you've got to publish what your rollback millage rate would be but for this tax increase. And that's what makes the taxing entity <coughs> specifically APS so uncomfortable because I really listened to what they had to say and listened again <coughs> to what their CFO Lisa Bracken presented at a meeting in October and they say in very real terms their their millage rate used to be 21.74 they rolled it back this year to 20.74 but they said but for all the tax digest we don't benefit from meaning specifically but for the tax digest within the TADS we could choose, we could, we could tax three mills less. In other words, APS specifically says in public that three mills of their 20 mills they assess, they never see because they are paying mills on, t on property that's within TADS. And furthermore, this is three mills of the five mills they have to submit to the state for the educational, um, uh, Obligation, is that right? Each each mm -hmm. each school district sends five mills and gets something back and APS gets something back less than what it sends. But that part of the taxpayer bill of rights, I think, is what the taxing entity strains <laughs> so much at. Not having to say we're raising our budget, but having to say our rollback millage rate would be X when that's really requiring them to set a millage rate I think we should come up with a concept of the effective tax digest, which is something less than the, the bigger tax digest because APS would tell you there's something like $25 million in the tax digest they never see. 
So that was a long way to say, um, as to number seven here, possibly revisit what that notice has to say, but understand that some of, um, some of the published tax digest is not actually available to the taxing entities to tax and, and enjoy the tax on because they don't get the proceeds from that tax digest. All right. Yes, Ms. Gardner. Of ta looking at the impact of the TAD, which is maybe outside the the purview of this particular study committee, but somehow when people look at tax bills and compare properties, they're not aware of those kinds of abatements that have been granted. And the recommendation someone suggested to me is that the tax bill, and maybe this is something a local could do, but would indicate what the tax abatement was. Was it, uh, is it in the TAD? Is it, has it been given some other special abatement of some sort? Because it does skew the public's understanding of yeah. what they're paying taxes for. Okay. Would that be something that you would want to include in that notice? Is that what? I don't know how specific we want to be, but uh, but it would be very helpful for people who go out searching the the, the um, appraisals on various properties to know that there was an abatement on that property, and that's why the taxes looked lower than they should have been, or they're. Okay. Anything else? And I don't think that. And I don't know whether we're going to continue in, in another year and looking at the exemptions, but th but the, there certainly is a lot of interest in somehow standardizing the exemptions or making them uh, revising, reforming, updating. Certainly in Fulton County and the city of Atlanta, I suspect it's true other places too. Old local legislation that somehow still hangs around and nobody even can find. Okay. I, I mean, that's obviously beyond the scope of what we're doing, but I, right. I, you know, we can we can we can recommend that there be a review of exemptions. And have we sort of dropped the idea of the phase-in increases? I mean, maybe that maybe we don't say do it, but consider it or take a look at how it could be done. Okay. And that's a phase-in payment of the mm, of the payment, assessed value. Yeah. Other comments from members? Okay, well, what we'll do is we'll, it's, it's 1221, so what I'll do is we'll open it up for about 15 minutes. If those that have heard the discussion today would like to comment um, on what you've heard from the committee, the discussions being had from the committee, if there are points that um, we raised that you think that uh, need a response. Um, I think that, for example, Representative Beskin has you know, raised the co property tax notice. I think it would be helpful to hear a little bit about that um, just to, to make sure we're all clear about what that what it does, what it's intended to do, and what maybe it doesn't do but ought to do. Um, and ACCG, you've raised the issue. Um, and, uh, maybe Mr. Ramsey can add to that. Other comments about um, the, you know, the three-year valuation cycle, um, the, the, that, that has received a lot of discussion here um, on whether it should be county-specific, whether it should be state, geographic, how maybe it is done in other jurisdictions that you've seen, if you, if you know. Um, and um, I think those were two, two main issues. And then we did spend a good bit of time talking about this 85% rule and the attorney's fees. Um, I think those are some of the areas that you may want to touch on if you feel like we have not adequately discussed it here or there's information you'd like to share. So with that, I'll just ask you to come forward to the, the witness mic here, number two, and, and just sign in on that piece of paper so we have a record of you being here and your testimony. Um, introduce yourself to the committee. Tell us uh, with 
with whom you're or whom you're representing, if anyone, um, and then and we'll try to take some notes quickly. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I've been before the committee. Um, I'm James Roberts. I'm um, with the Georgia Asso Association of Property Tax Professionals, and it's a trade organization. Uh, and we wanted to be a resource uh, as we as well as much as we could. And we just wanted to have some uh, one degree of clarification on the 85% because there was a lot of discussion about that. And that was one of the things that we had put out there as something to consider. Um, in 202, it actually, the way the law actually reads, it's the taxpayer has the option of paying on 85, originally has the option of paying on 85% of the proposed value or the prior year value, whichever is less. So there's, you know, that was left out. It's, so the taxpayer, if, it, if the prior year value is less than 85% of the proposed number, the, it, def, it should, under law, default to that. I'm not sure all the counties are abiding by the law, but that's the way the cab, Fulton, most counties that, that we do here in Metro will default to that amount. The 85%, again, and this has nothing to do with attorney fees. The 85%, I don't know where that number came from years ago. It, you know, what, maybe they just thought by giving them a 15% cushion it would be better. But, but if it's a dramatic, if it doubles, they have the right to pay at last year's value. In, in the old days, that was called the last uncontested value. They accepted that value. And so that made sense. You know, you accepted that in the past, so that's the value you'll pay on until the appeal is complete. And so that was fine. And 202 allowed the taxpayer to pay at 100%, which also is good, too, because you have many instances, especially among commercial taxpayers, where they are billing their tenants. They are budgeting, and sometimes appeals take years or can take a long time. They pay at the 100%. That's the known number. Whatever it comes out to be is an unknown, but the known is 100%. And then you pay from the known and you work down. The part that we had suggested is that the 85% on many taxpayers confuses and tricks them. We've actually heard homeowners get the 85% bill and think, oh, well, great. They've reduced my assessment 15% and I'm not going to do my appeal. Mm -hmm. That's not what the intent of the law was, but that's the impact of that law. And that's why one of the things that we had recommended was consider just doing away with 85%. It has, has no bearing in it and go back to either 100% or the prior year value. That was the last uncontested amount. Now, punitively, that may penalize the county for, you know, in terms of um, collecting the additional revenue. But it also saves the county a whole lot of, of trouble trying to go back and write computer programs to calculate how much the taxpayer owes. Many times, taxpayers default on that 15% because they go, oh, crap, I mean, I won my appeal, I got a 10% reduction, but I owe 5% in tax? That doesn't make sense. So what you're trying to do in that regard is be a little more transparent with the taxpayer and what they're doing. Um, before this past year, the taxpayer would have to owe interest should they owe additional taxes. That was taken out. The, ta the county has to pay interest on refunds, which, honestly, and I work for commercial clients, that, that moves the appeal process along some as well because if the county knows that they're going to have to pay interest at a half to 1% a month, that can be some big money on some of these buildings. So they're more... In, they're more they will move the appeal process along a little quicker because it's going to ca cost the tax commissioner's interest money. So just to clarify, in law, we have the ability now for the taxpayer to pay at the prior year value, whichever is less. It's the 85% in there that nobody seems to can figure out. I'm talking about just from the billing standpoint. And it is a great source of confusion for many taxpayers. And that, that was a clarification that I wanted to make sure everybody understood. And it's like this gentleman said, the three-year cycle will probably, it will help eliminate this um, because you have more systematic, more frequent reassessments. Some of the properties in Fulton that were reassessed hadn't been reassessed in six, seven years. So a more systematic reappraisal will probably eliminate some of the huge value swings that you've seen right now that creates that problem. But that's the only thing that I just wanted to clarify, you know, the, the existence of the 85 percent. But Okay. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you. James, appreciate it. Any comments on the three-year cycle? Because I think your organization had proposed 
um, that you know, three-year well, assessment, and then and then um, the comment on that, but also if you could, let's try to see if you can help address, if you know, right. what uh, Representative Baskin was saying and her concerns and sure. President Garden. Right, and and I believe my understanding was the balkanization of that, which I you know I understand one pitting against the other, pitting against the other, um, and I'm not really sure if if you know how you would do the three year if if you do it within a county, what you're trying to do is make it manageable. Um, in other words, you, you're going to have if you can divide it up in a certain way that is predictable and manageable then the north part of Fulton knows they're going to get reassessed once every three years. And I'm just making the, – the south probably hadn't been reassessed, quite frankly, in maybe seven or eight years. So there could be some you – know, but they're going to get caught. Every, they're going to get reassessed. Every parcel in that county is going to be touched once every three years. So that okay. it's more uniform, it's more fair. From a sales standpoint, it would be predictable from the, from the real estate agents that I talk to, they know – they know that – the, the, the assessments are going to be the same for the next two years, and here's your third year. So that it's predictable. You can actually, and when I'm looking at doing a tax estimate for one of my clients down the road, I can say, you know what, I don't know what they're going to do with this thing. I can all, with now with certainty, I can say, yes, you're going to be here, here, and then in this third year, you will be here. Does that make sense to you? There's uh, quite a bit of transparency there and predictability. Um, whether or not you do it statewide, in terms of dividing the state, the, o the only reason, you know, you go back to the Maryland thing, the Maryland situation is done because it's, it's, they found it to be manageable. In other words, you're not having 350,000 parcels in Fulton County. You can do it in early county. But in Fulton County, you're not having 350,000 parcels reappraised in one year. And then in three years, you've got to do it all over again. What you find if you divide it third, 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 then the county – the assessor's office can manage what they're doing. Th does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And be more accountable to the taxpayer. The taxpayer will, uh, you know, it, it, it's like change. Change is hard. It will be a, a transition at first, but then it becomes predictable to them. So, and I don't think it was an intent to, to, to balkanize or divide up Fulton County. It, it's because you're right. The unintended consequences, there's 350 or 360,000 parcels. Practically speaking, that's hard to do in one year, although it's been done. But that leads itself to <laughs> that leads itself to more errors in and of itself, if you follow me. So dividing it into thirds allows for a, a better, in my, uh, my opinion, about the county to do a better job. All right, thank you, Mr. Roberts. Any yeah. questions? Thank, yes. thank you. Uh, Mr. Ramsey, did you have a comment you'd like to share with us on the property tax notice or anything else? Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. On the taxpayer bill and of rights notice issue, I think the, the proposal from ACCG was, was pretty modest, and there was a bill last year uh, in the House that Rep Representative Randy Nix had introduced, and that was aimed just at changing the wording in the notice. Uh, we've heard from many of our members, and I don't think it's just a county issue about how confusing the citizens get, how confused the citizens get with the wording of the notice. And so it's not, from ACCG's perspective, it's not a challenge or a, an, a request to change the fundamental issue of is this a tax increase. If you're exceeding your rollback rate, I think it's fair to say that overall taxes have been increased and in the issue we were raising was simply about the notice because if you read the notice I've got at least one county that says they published the notice that's required by the statute and then they run another notice next to it to explain what the first notice means <laughs> because and again I've, I, I won't get into the weeds of it unless you want me to but the the notice says it's currently required to be written reads as if everybody's taxes are going up X dollars um, it gives a sample, you have to give an average assessed value, and here's what the increase in taxes would be. If your given property was not reassessed and the millage rate did not increase, your taxes aren't going up at all, but if you read the notice, you assume that it is. That's the way it's written. So that was simply an effort to make the notice more accurately reflect what's going on when the rollback rate is exceeded. But Representative Beskin, I think, makes a, a great point about this effective tax digest and another beyond the TAD situation 
I think another situation where that comes into play and was also part of the Atlanta legislation, which has to do with floating homestead exemptions. I know Chatham calls it the Stevens Day exemption, but more and more counties, cities throughout the state are having these floating homestead exemptions approved where I own a piece of property. When my exemption goes into effect, it doesn't matter how much my value goes up over time. I'm only going to be taxed on that value when the exemption was put into place. It's a floating exemption that grows until that property changes hands. That's part of the overall tax digest that's not being captured, just like TADS, that there's, it's, there's a digest number and then there's the what's being taxed. And so I think that's a great point. I don't have a specific recommendation about how, how that would work in practice, but you're right. I mean, there's, that's another artificiality that's built into potentially into the system when you have a tax increase for Taxpayer Bill of Rights purposes. But, and I, I live in Cobb County in the city of Smyrna, they both have floating homestead exemptions. My value, my assessed value goes up, but my taxes do not, right? And so I'm not getting the tax increase, although the notice that's stated in the paper would indicate that I am. So I, I do think all of those are, are wrapped together an issue. That's something that would, I know the committee was talking about staying away from exemptions, but, the, but that's an issue that very much plays into the tax allocation district issue that Representative Beston brought up. And I, again, we're starting from the perspective of simply looking for more clarity for the citizens on, on what that notice says but it does raise a, a bigger issue of how do we reflect what the effective digest is as opposed to what the on paper numbers are. Yes, Representative Beskin. Oh, sorry, Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I, I'm glad you brought that issue up because from a, from a basic point of view of fairness, when there are people who are paying diff different taxes on the same street, it, it's puzzling to me how that can be ongoing constitutionally fair but I don't I don't, and I don't know the answer to that but it seems like it was some recommendation to make a constitutional amendment of some sort and I can't find who made that recommendation but to authorize the commissioners to set certain limitations on property I don't know anyway, and I, I don't believe I, that was us I you, know, you don't about think that was you <laughs> about the constitutional fair issue <laughs> I do know, and of course, Legislative Council could speak to that. There, there's the uniformity provision, but then there's also separate constitutional authority for homestead exemptions. And so I think that's the basis where we end up with this hodgepodge of different exemptions throughout right. the state. And, and you're right, I think in a, in a given neighborhood, if they find out, if I find out my next door neighbor paid half the taxes that I do, it may not be easy to explain the, the reason for that, that your homestead exemption is bigger. And maybe that's not fair, but that's the system that we have when you have these floating homestead exemptions. That's why they call that the welcome neighbor. That's provision. exactly. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, uh, we're at 1236 now. Any, any other comments from those that have attended from members of the audience. Else, right? There may be there may be a lot of <laughs> comments out in the hallway. Um, it, we're, we're we're lucky to hear um, the the children the voices of children <coughs> out in the hallway, and uh, they're visiting the Capitol and the Capitol is adorned in Christmas attire and it looks beautiful here. Um, I must say and and they're and those kids are visiting and taking in the holiday seasons and. Someday, some one or two of those children out there will be sitting in these chairs, and that's um, probably the, probably the same chairs. <laughs> Representative Baskin says that's that's probably true. Um, as long as they work, I don't, we don't need new ones. Um, all right, with that, what I'll do is just uh, you know, turn it back over to the committee. Um, and, and at this time, what I'd like to do is just ask the committee members to um, to look at the sheets and and. And if you have a set of recommendations that you would like to, to put forth, um, while you're thinking about that, uh, feel free to draw upon any that we have covered and the eight that we've covered here, any additional ones that you, have, that you think about. Remember, these are recommendations. These are not, this is not law. This is not going to be, uh, there's some of the recommendations may 
wind up in code. Um, some may not. Some may wind up in regulation. Um, while you're thinking about that, just uh, I, I would like us to, when whatever recommendation we have we approve, um, that we do submit as part of our report um, the summary that Brian has put together. It's a consolidated summary of all the information. I would like for the committee to approve this not as our recommendations but just as part of the committee's report to the public so that everyone knows what, what, we, what information we took in. Um, so that package, I would like that to be included in, in our submittal. Um, that's, my, that's really my only ask. And if, if the committee's desire is to, to make no recommendations but simply just to, cert just to submit the summary um, and uh, th that I just mentioned, the, the package summary, that is certainly an option, um, as well as making any specific um, recommendations to the General Assembly is also an option, and, and making them as detailed or as open-ended as you wish. So with that, I'm as the chairman, I'm going to turn it over to the committee, and the committee is going to make a decision one way or the other um, a motion and a second on some ideas and concepts for recommendations. And if not, we'll adjourn at one o'clock. So it's one of the two is going to happen. And we'll, we'll adjourn signing die for this committee. <laughs> we're going to be done. Um, so I'm going to put the ball in your court. Good news is that um, I guess I'm probably the only person on the committee that's going to have to deal with Chairman Jay Powell <laughs> come January with whatever recommendations we uh, we make. The rest of you get skate on out of here. That 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 was an that is an op. I want to make sure that I had that as an option. I would do a second. I have a motion yeah. from Representative Beskin. I have a second from Mr. Powers. Any um, any discussion on the motion that's before the committee? Uh, I'd just like to ask the way it's styled. It it says summary of suggested recommendation. It's a very good observation. If it's a recommendation, I like to think that I would have to recuse myself from voting because of the judicial ethics that I'm under. I'm not allowed to be involved in the political process. So. But you're so good at it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really not. If I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, it would be what it was. Well, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can do a summary of suggested recommendations from – Stakeholders, as a, as opposed to from the yeah. committee itself. That would help. Would that? Yeah. That you you, st you, st you still may not want to vote on it, Judge, but 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 for benefit of the committee, that's that's what these are. This is not. This is by no means any one member of the committee's statements. This is a an academic summary of what we've received in testimony and yeah from stakeholders and from. And I can put it as su summary of suggested recommenda recommendations presented to the committee. Summary of discussions on the so-called recommendation. That's just for me. I mean, y'all may want it to be a recommendation. So well, these were these were recommendations. Tonight. These were recommendations They're that were submitted to us. They're not ours. They're recommendations submitted to us. So they are recommendations, but they're just not ours. So I, that's why I was a summary of recommendations presented to the committee. Um, Does the text suggest it ought to say summary of recommendations suggested to the committee? Is that the final one? Okay, so we'll have the um, House Study Committee on Reforming 
uh, real tax, real property taxation, summary of recommendations presented to the committee, December 5th, 2018. And we, with that being, um, that change, would that change be acceptable to the movement of this? And that is that acceptable to the second Bowers group of that? All right. Well, we'll just adopt that as 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 an amendment to the proposed um, motion and uh, by consensus. And then, is there any more discussion on the the on the motion? All right. Seeing no more discussion on the motion, I'll call for a vote, uh, noting that. Uh, the judge and the commissioner are abstaining from the vote. The rest of us will be asked to vote on the measure. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All those opposed, like sign. It passes unanimously with those of two abstentions. And um, with that, I will extend my most heartfelt gratitude to all of you, um, especially Mr. Powers, who has to drive in from Savannah. And I know Mr. Dempsey drives in from Rome from time to time. So. Um, Please understand that, that I very much appreciate your time. Um, and I know individual members have not been able to join us for um, every meeting. Um, I know one member did not join us for any meetings. Um, uh, but, I, but I do know that, um, I, please understand that I do really appreciate your time. And I appreciate the discussion today, the feedback, um, <coughs> the candid and sincere comments um, and uh, concerns that have been raised by the committee members. It, the dialogue is what's important, but with a short study window, um, it's also important to understand before we talk. And so I, I felt like we needed to accumulate information before we had this discussion today. But I appreciate all the input. Um, and I also appreciate all the input from members of the public, from the different organizations that have been here today, that have come at every single meeting, um, that have submitted very uh, robust recommendations for the research that individuals have done for the Clerks Association, the research that you have done um, on behalf of your organization, um, very, very much valued. Um, so, um, and Commissioner, thank you to the department uh, for your staff's uh, presentations and assistance in this. I'm very grateful. Um, with that and no other further comments from the committee. I just want to thank the chairman for yeah. creating quite a, a good educational experience. Thank you thank to our you. staff, Jordan <laughs> and Brian Groom, who are not here right now, and Paul, thank you for subbing in for Blake, and we appreciate all of you and all the hard work that you do behind the scenes, um, accumulating information. Brian is not here, and, and Judge, you're correct. Uh, Brian has been of tremendous uh, in importance and an asset to the committee by bringing all this information in, distilling it down, and helping to guide discussions, and I'm grateful to him. And Jordan, thank you for subbing in for him. We appreciate you being here today and your questions as well. With that, um, again, uh, I appreciate everybody's time today. We'll stand adjourned. Just in time for lunch. <laughs>